increased efficiency in the number of specifically black engineers, but women engineers. Um, I uh, typically, and when I first started my first job, um, I was the only black, only female, and the age gap between me and the next person was 15 years. Um, I'm here tonight because a lot of conversation around um, what's going on out in the world with the protests with um, Black Lives Matter um, has kind of fallen to me um, being as uh, typically the only minority in um, some of the spaces that I've moved in and worked in. A lot of people have come to me to just check in um, from non-minority communities and other minority communities to just figure out what they can do. And I became a point of reference for being the only African-American in the workspace. Um, so um, I appreciate Shante um, for inviting me to be a panelist today and I hope I can give you my perspective. <laughs> Thank you. Darren, I see you itching to get off of mute. Let's, let's go. <laughs> no, just hey, hey, guys. Uh, it's uh, Darren Mitchell. Ashante, first off, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I've been 15 years in banking, so I'm a corporate banker at J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, executive director. Uh, my focus is primarily on calling on companies $100 million and above in working capital needs, uh, mergers and acquisitions, meaning helping client companies buy other companies. Uh, I'm used to being uh, very limited uh, African American in my space. Uh, banking is not very, not a very diverse industry. I hope that I look forward to that changing one day. I've been conditioned. I went to uh, University of Notre Dame, which is a pr predominantly white school as well. So uh, I've been, uh, I'm, I'm kind of used to it. But I look forward to this discussion and and then diving into the topic. So, thanks for having me. I'm gonna pass it off to Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, again, too, thank you, Shante, for including me. Shante and I have had the pleasure of working together many years ago and have stayed in touch throughout the transitions of our career. Um, I am Nicole Fisher. I am the Vice President of Treasury Management for J.P. Morgan Chase. I actually cover the South Florida and the Georgia market for clients um, that serve 100 million and above. So I actually work with Darren on a lot of deals. Um, we cross paths and um, are just great partners. So it's great to see someone who looks like ourselves having a seat at the table. Um, as Beth stated, there's not a lot of women who do what I do. My um, industry is very unique as it relates to the finance space. I deal directly with clients' overall cash management process. And what that means is, I come in and really advise clients on how to manage their cash flow in order for their businesses to function on a day-to-day -day basis. What that means is how they pay their employees, how they manage their vendors, anything to do with the working capital of their finance industry of their clients. Um, so a lot of times I am not only the only woman at the table, I am the only black woman at the table and black person. Um, so that, that speaks a lot um, in this industry and I'm looking forward to seeing more people like myself join the industry and really get the exposure that's needed. So thank you, Shante, for inviting me to have this conversation and being a part of this panel. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I'm last but not least, Shante. <laughs> that's what it looks like. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, um, first of all, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Holmes. And uh, I've been in the uh, higher ed industry for the last 18 years, serving predominantly in a uh, enrollment director capacity for uh, large public research institutions, uh, historically black colleges and universities, uh, public IVs, uh, community colleges, uh, online entities as well. And um, I was uh, appreciative of the offer and opportunity to come and speak this evening and serve on the panel. Um, and Shante is a very dear friend of mine and um, certainly understanding that uh, now is the time to have these kinds of conversations. Uh, I wore uh, a t-shirt this evening of my favorite boxer of all time, the greatest, Muhammad Ali. And um, I often refer to being black uh, in higher ed as uh, it's like the training of a boxer. Um, it's a very individualized sport, but you have to have a good team in your corner as it relates to trainers, um, advocates, uh, specialists, promoters, 
And uh, it's with that kind of community that I have established throughout my career that has really kept me sane during these times. Um, oftentimes, especially the higher up in the industry that I go, uh, the, the fewer and fewer people that I see, people of color that I see are sitting around the decision-making table. Um, in my case, in most of my meetings throughout the course of my day, I'm generally the only uh, person of color on the call, or in this case, on a Zoom call. Um, I'm usually the only uh, male of color in, uh, in a lot of the circles that I have to engage in on a daily, day in and day out basis. And so uh, I'm excited to be here this evening and uh, hopefully we can have a very in-depth conversation that will be beneficial to uh, all of the people who are watching this evening. Oh my goodness, thank you all so much. And I will, I will say that again at the end and all around that I can um, for helping me bring this, this vision together. Um, and I would like to just put out uh, what I am calling a disclaimer, <laughs> that uh, all of us have a nine to five <laughs> and some side hustles on the side. But anything that you hear for tonight will be representative of ourselves, not the organizations to which we are affiliated with. Um, and so I just want to make that clear that these thoughts and opinions um, are really our experiences uh, as a person and not as representatives of any of the organizations that we support and or work for. All right. Well, with that said, um, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping items uh, before we kick off the discussion. So uh, I, I want to thank everyone for coming into the space already with their videos off and on mute, it makes things a lot easier from a technology perspective. Um, those who have been working with Zoom <laughs> over the last few months realize that Zoom has some hiccups at times. And so what we've learned is that if everyone would keep their videos off, then it will be a little bit less of a technology issue versus everybody coming off and speaking. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or issues, please drop it in the chat for us. And if you have some, a question that's directly related to something that the panelists are talking about, also put that in the chat. But if you would like to come off of mute and cut your camera on, please raise your hand and one of our lovely co-hosts will um, ping you and let you know when it's time to, to shift in. Um, there have been a lot of questions for me around what the timing of tonight is. And so um, I just wanna say that tonight's session is scheduled for an hour. I have asked that if the panelists um, feel it in their heart, and if you all have some questions, that you, additional questions you would like to ask them, that they could stay on for an additional 30 minutes for a Q&A, but that is the max amount of time that we will be spending in this space tonight. And I would love to honor that, and the PM in me will keep us straight. So, um, and for those of you that don't know how to raise your hand, just really quickly, if you click on the participants tab, all the participants will show up. And at the very bottom, you'll see yes, no, go slower, go faster, and then you'll see more. You can do thumbs up, thumbs down, you can wave your hand, all sorts of fun stuff. Okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get us started. So, with the reality of being Black and authentic in the workplace, to what extent do you feel you can disclose your whole identity to your colleagues? And that question is for anyone on the panel. I can start. Okay, I'll start. So, um, so I went to, uh, I attended a historically black college in North Carolina A&T uh, State University. And there they drill into you the proper etiquettes of the, and professionalism in the office space. So the black suit to the interview, small earrings, nothing too flashy, not too many bright colors, um, uh, making sure your resume's in a certain format and everything. They prepare you to get yourself in the door. Um, and with my parents, um, who both worked jobs 40 plus years, the same job, um, most of their careers, it was also ingrained in me that there's a level of uh, professionalism that you have to wear and what they consider 
how you are outside the place with your friends versus what you wear and what you, how you communicate in the office. I find myself, um, like I said, with a lot of the positions that I've had throughout the years, I was typically the only female or definitely the only female black um, who was an engineer and so forth. Um, and for a long time, I was uncomfortable wearing my own natural hair. I was uncomfortable wearing my big earrings, um, expressing myself, um, being my true authentic self in the workplace. And it took me, I think personally, to stop, um, to become more comfortable in my own skin as I matured as an individual. Um, and my work and my performance began to ring out to what I could contribute that I became more comfortable um, and started wearing my big afros at work and um, wearing more of my loud prints, wearing African skirts to work and things like that. And it was actually um, interesting in my current position where I support, I'm a federal employee for the US government and I run a large um, IT department where um, people stopped me in the hallway with my afro and told me, um, because they know I'm a manager, that it's nice to see someone who looks like me being themselves, um, wearing the, the, um, the outfits um, and the clothes, being, having my big hair out, not afraid to just wear my Afro um, when I want to. It, it helps, and it also helped them to feel like they could become more comfortable in the workspace as well. Um, in terms of communication, I still struggle with that because I feel like I still put that distance between myself and other coworkers when it comes to what I, who I am and what I do outside of work. I think I'm always gonna be a little bit like that. Um, but I noticed that when I see another person in the workspace that looks like me, who's from the black community, things like that, we tend to cluster together and support each other and say, hey, I'm gonna look out for you, you're gonna look out for me, we're gonna work together and whether, um, whether out front or not, it, it, um, we start to build each other up and become more and more comfortable um, to communicate. And with that person, I feel like I can do that. Um, I can let some of that guard down, not have to do the code switching, things like that, that go on commonly in the office place. Um, it's me, I think it's a personal journey for some where you are comfortable and things like that. Um, but I know as I aged and I got into my 30s and now into my late 30s, I became more comfortable as I uh, grew into my own role and started owning who I am. And, and Shante, I'll, I'll, I'll dive in a little bit in, on that as well. Uh, first off, I think that's a great question. Um, I think it, it is a very delicate uh, topic um, because I, I think it's, it's twofold. One is I think it's easier to be yourself when you have a little more credibility and further in your career. I think coming out of college and, and starting in your career, you kind of have to you kind of have to play the part. You have to play the role. Unfortunately, we don't want to. We want to water down, but but you kind of have to play that part. And as you start to build a name and, and a brand for yourself, then you can kind of bring that culture. You can bring that flair because you've already proven yourself, and they're they're going to support you because they want you there. They want your input. They want your your guidance. And so for me, I think is coming from an institution that is very in banking in general is very um, is conservative. Mm -hmm. And so we're we're talking. It's actually we're so conservative. It's almost I've, I've kind of taken a piece of that into my personal, you know? So it's hard to turn it off because you're so formal at times, you know, dealing with clients, talking about tough situations, financial situations, challenges, you know, you can't come in, uh, you know, you, you wanna be, be, the, be the part, you know, look like them in the room and, and, and show that you, you belong in the room. And Nicole, you probably can add to that because you share the same stuff, I know. Um, and, and just to add to what Darren said, I agree 100%. We both work in an industry financial driven that is very conservative. Um, so when you walk into a room, majority of the time you see the gray, the black, the blue suits. And if you see someone with loud color, they automatically stand out. And that's their first impression of you. They haven't gotten an opportunity to really understand what you bring to the table, what your qualifications are, whether or not you are the subject matter expert in your field, because all they see is the first thing is you're, you're bright. Um, and so kind of like to Darren and I said, for me, I've been in banking for 20 years. I started not aging myself, but back when we had no choice but to wear pantyhose to work and a skirt because women wore skirts and men wore pants. 
And that is the culture that I grew up in in my career that at all times you are professional, you are put together, you are groomed, you are conservative, especially in front of clients or senior leadership. That is what you have to do. So yeah, sometimes it's, it's kind of spilled over into my personal life. And every now and then I will bring out a bit of my personality, whether it be on a Friday where it's more acceptable. But for me personally, I'm having that conversation with my daughter now. Yes, I want you to be able to show your true personality, but at the right time, earn your credibility, earn your place, play the game, and then you have that right to be comfortable. I've just gotten to a stage in my life where I'm comfortable um, now that we're on Zoom calls, not being the buttoned up professional that I am at all times. I'm starting to feel myself break away from that because of the environment that we're in today. You're working from home, you're more comfortable. But when you're sitting in this boardroom and you walk in with a table full of executives or you are having the opportunity to participate, the worst, the one thing you don't want is for any additional attention to be called to you based on not only the color of your skin, but what your attire looks like. Are you professionally dressed? How are you groomed? Um, for me, that's just something that was important to me and I learned early in my career and I've learned to, to, to express myself that way. I would, I would concur with everything that has been said thus far. Um, for me, um, starting out working at a, at a uh, predominantly white institution early in my career, of course, you have to dress for the, the, the part that you want, mm -hmm. right? You know, that's something that my grandfather always told me, you know, smile so you won't look too threatening. Uh, make sure that you're wearing a suit. Make sure you have your hair cut and you're fully shaved. You know, back in the day, you know how the brothers are wearing a lot of beards now. Back in the day, that wasn't that wasn't acceptable. <laughs> and that, that's coming from people within the black community. Like, why do you have all of that hair on your face? Um, but what I also learned that, um, yeah, there there is some code switching that is involved. However, um, I became my my uh, authentically uh, dope self by way of my competence by way of my competence in proving that, yes, I am the subject matter expert. Oh, and by the way, I do have a mohawk. Or yes, I am the subject matter expert. And oh, by the way, I do have cornrows. Uh, but at the same time, my suit is pressed to a T. My, my white shirt is clean. And I'm in any situation, I'm about my business. And so I think you, you do have to find that level of balance where, mm -hmm. where it's a necessary to uh, establish credibility, but also you have to be confident in your own competence. You know, if I go into any meeting or making a, a big presentation in front of a, a predominantly white audience, um, you know, the things that I pray to God for is to allow me to uh, bring forth my skills. And that's through my competence, my compassion and, uh, and my commitment to what I'm doing. And, you know, I think you have to build that level of confidence to figure out at what point in your career that you can take chances without getting any blowback as a result of attire or natural hair or, uh, you know, large earrings. You know, um, you know, in a lot of the cultures that we come from, you know, the large earrings, that's a sound, that's a sign of prosperity, you know. That's a sign of prosperity. The, the, the big hair, that means that, you know, I have the means to uh, get my hair done every, every two weeks or get a haircut every two weeks. And so I, I don't think that we should have to run from it, but you do have to be confident in yourself. You have to be uh, competent in your position and within your profession. And then you also have to uh, really weigh your options that everything comes with the opportunity cost. Just because you have freedom of choice doesn't mean that, you have, that you're free, free from consequence. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you can't say, well, man, I'm going to blame it on the man because they won't let me they won't let me rock my my uh, my locks. Or I'm going to blame it on the man because, you know, I, I walked into that building with my natural hair and then all of a sudden I didn't get the job. And so you also have to be able to read the room and understand the organizations that you're, mm -hmm. you're going to ha have to work with. And sometimes they may align with your own personal mission. Sometimes they don't. But it's, it's up to you uh, to make that choice. Oh, my goodness you guys rolled right into the next question. And so we're just gonna keep this discussion going. Um, the next question is, do you mask or downplay mm -hmm. aspects of your physical, cultural, spiritual, or emotional self at work? And if so, how does that show up for you? Kevin, you were leading us right on yeah, in there. I'll kick it, in. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> kick it off. You know, from, <laughs> from my perspective, um, you know, I thought that that was something that I had to do at one point in my career, that I had to mask who I was. But once again, I'm unapologetically dope. 
And so I can't be anything other but myself, regardless of any situation. You know, yeah, I may have a Southern draw and a, and a, and a, a Southeast Hampton Roads dialect. You know, I, uh, I may be a, a bit um, boisterous in, in some cases, but at the same time, um, I, I, can't, I can't do my best work without being my pure authentic self. Right. And, 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 you know, have I, have I uh, handicapped myself in my career in some regard by, by taking that approach in some cases, but you know, those institutions that um, either turn me down or pass over me for a particular position, it wasn't meant for me to be with their organization in the first place. And so I, I can't apologize for who I am. You know, I, I think about it from the context of where I've come from. I, I was on a panel discussion last week and I had an aha moment. Uh, my grandmother did not finish high school in 1958 because the state of Virginia shut down the school systems because they didn't want to integrate. And so my mother was the first person in my immediate family to graduate from high school. And so when I'm in a uh, boardroom and I'm speaking to a hundred white faculty members about why they need to incorporate certain admission standards and practices within their programs, I know where I come from. And I'm, I'm not going to apologize for, it, especially in this day and age, and and, and the fact that, um, you know, we we have to wear carry this burden on on our back constantly, and so I I can't be my own burden based on who I am. So I mean, I'll, I'll jump in there too, from just some, from a from a corporate side, um, it, it's a little bit different. I mean, I think when you know I've been forced to at times, you know, put a mask on. And I think when I look at the strategy of what I'm trying to accomplish long term, you got to play the game. Let's let's be real. This it, it it is a game. It is strategy. You can you can try to be yourself, and and I I commend it. I'm, I'm myself a lot of times, but I find myself on elevators having to be the first person to speak because they see I'm six four. They see this big black man on the elevator, and the first thing is is fear, or they've got these preconceived thoughts, you know, or uh, um, biases that are in place that I got to uh, overcome right out the gate. I walk into a meeting, you know, I'll, I'll meet clients who don't, or prospects who don't want to shake my hand. You know, it's fear. Or I, on the flip side of it, it'd be a good conversation. I'll walk in and all they want to talk about is sports. It's like, I know you play football. So let's talk about sports, but we don't get to any of the business part. And then there'll be another banker come in and talk about the business and get all the information that I didn't get. So I have to have to kind of mediate that piece of it too. So again, I think this is, this is another delicate topic, it, topic excuse me, but Oh, I do find myself at times having to put a mask on. Is it tiring? Hell yeah, it's super tiring. I mean, you kind of have to be the happy guy all the time when sometimes you just want to walk in, do your work, go go home. And so you, I don't have that luxury at times, but, you know, it's, it's what I signed up for. It's, it's um, kind of my strategy and how I play the game. So yeah. that's for me. I can jump in. Oh, okay. I agree with what's been said already. Um, even to a certain extent, that even though I feel like I can wear my natural hair, I can, um, uh, now that I'm kind of more in leadership and in more control and I've proven myself in my career, I can be a little bit more of myself, wear my African skirts or my business suit jackets, um, things along those lines. However, there is a certain level where I know being one of the youngest, being a female, being black, I've walked into meetings with nothing but men and people think, are you taking notes? Mm -hmm. versus I'm the actual one making the decision here. So actually, um, mm -hmm. and there is still a, a part of me that when I walk into certain rooms with new folk, new clients or so forth, or new, uh, new management who may not be familiar with me, I have to do this, I do this disarming to make them feel comfortable with me, whether it's light water cooler conversation or point to something or go, um, go above and beyond to prove that I am qualified for what I'm speaking on by giving an excess of information. So there's no question to my credentials. I feel like um, that still goes on, like uh, still being challenged, but it's much more passive now. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a mask that you have to wear and always have your defenses up in some regard because sometimes um, you just by walking in the room or your presence is immediately disqualifying. And, and just to add to that, exactly what you just said, um, I've experienced that. I've walked into a room to sit at a boardroom table. Um, I go to sit down at the table and all the men are looking at me like, why are you not sitting with the women taking notes? Because unfortunately, a lot of the admins are women. 
Yeah. Um, and it really kind of, it really, I look to them as let me mentor you. Let me help you figure out how you can have my seat as well. Because mm -hmm. it gets lonely being the only woman or the only black woman sitting at a table having to really, like you said, prove yourself every single time. It's almost like you have to have a certain arrogance about yourself in order for yeah. them to take you seriously, to know that you know what you're talking about, you've done the work, you understand, you have the experience. Um, and so it can be exhausting. So I always feel like sometimes you have a mask on. I don't give them always my true authentic self. I mean, I may have a colleague that I have built a relationship with because we have a common ground and we've built that that camaraderie we've built that common interest and even though they may not look like me we have a respect level that i think was built but on the initial onset of meeting i always have my guard up and knowing i need to be the best person i can be because you are judging me within the first 30 seconds that you meet me hmm. um and so i feel like at any given moment we just don't really have a lot of opportunity to really allow them to see that side of us um and so we play would, the game like Dan said. I would agree. In, 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 I would in agree, a, Nicole. I would agree because from the standpoint of um, a lot of the spaces where we are, you have to know your opponent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you and going mm -hmm. back to my boxing analogy, you have to protect yourself at all times. You can't you can't be too emotional. Right. You know, you have to kind of stick to a particular script. But then when there are moments where you can uh, release who you are and, and your authentic self. Uh, you know, whether or not it's building a relationship with a client um, or a peer, then, you know, you take advantage of those situations. But at the same time, you still have to know your opponent now. You can't go in naive. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Um, I, I have been faced with several situations. I think I've experienced it more in the South um, where I have walked into a client meeting and they automatically turn to the male colleague that may be with me as, the person that should be handling the relationship and I have to redirect him and he is in complete shock like what you know and and that is an ongoing I mean to this day 2020 we are still dealing with that same having to fight for no I'm the person that's managing your relationship your 500 million dollar relationship is me he's taking my notes kind of situation and so when you feel that you almost feel insulted but you also have conditioned yourself to say i am the consummate professional i know how to move around that and we're going to overcome your ignorance and we're going to continue with this meeting and once they figured out that we we've established that i've overcome that and we're going to get down to business the whole attitude changed so when I say I'm always having to mask myself, I'm always having to be on guard because the expectation that you get from everyone is not the same in any situation. I mean, well, well let's be honest. I mean, you only got 30 seconds typically to, to prove credibility when you walk in a room. I mean, we do. You know, most, I mean, uh, your counterparts, they can build a relationship over time to get to know, but at the end of the day, you got to prove that you're worthy to be in the room. And so a lot of times is if I can, dimming down a little bit to remove those biases out the room just so you can hear me and 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 see my credibility I, i'll do it but I, I think again it's it's a it's a it's a delicate situation because a lot of times i want to just walk and be like what's up you know because that's who i am but i can't you know so just to add that piece but yeah i, I think that that is it's really powerful that the four of you out of the four of you from a, a, an industry perspective, you're representing three different industries. And there's still the commonality of having to disarm yourself and having to show up a certain way when you walk into a room for the first time or when you're one of only, right? Whether you're the only man, black man, and then you're the only black female, let alone just female. <laughs> but then you throw on the caveat of being the only black female and one that is making decisions. And so I think that is really powerful, just the connection that while you all have different industries, that there are some really serious commonalities. And that's, you know, one mo main thing is that we share a, a skin tone. <laughs> 
and I think that that's really powerful. And as I'm, I'm being very conscious about the time, um, there's one that I think that is really important for one of the questions that came in that I think is really important for us to talk about, not just for our community, but also for our allies. Um, and so, um, Black leaders and professionals have expressed exhaustion with handholding their peers and educating them on racism, but feel that it's a necessity because they, I, don't want to have them miss an, an undereducated in the space. Have you all had any experience with that? And if so, how is it impacting you? Well, for me, I, um, you know, I've served served on our uh, within my organization, our diversity and inclusion task force. But uh, the task force cr was created prior to 2020, prior to COVID, prior to uh, a lot of the uh, social unrest in the country, and serving on that committee opened my eyes up to. The fact that yes, my voice is necessary uh, to provide input and perspective. However, with all that has gone on, I don't feel like I want to try to prescribe a solution to a problem where I am the victim <laughs> or my people are, are, are the victim. And so I, I am still, I'll be honest, the jury is still out with me. Um, I have had uh, allies reach out to me and, and true, true friends and true colleagues um, that have, have reached out because they know the value that I bring to the organization. They care about me as an individual. Um, however, I've also had kind of superficial questions asked, well, yeah, how are you doing? How are you, how are you, how, how are you, how are you holding on? Like, am I supposed to, sound nice and be happy in response to that question. I, I look at it like it's, it's almost like an abusive relationship, man. You know, you can't, you can't charge the victim to talk to the abuser and let the abuser know what you're doing wrong. Yeah, that's making them the victim in the, in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's really how I feel because I know, I know, I know it, it's an awkward conversation. I know in some cases the intent comes from a good place, but at the same time, you know, colleagues are, are they, they're not having to tell their black sons about George Floyd and then explain the history of that that's happened, that's happened to black men in America for 200 years. You know, they didn't have to explain, well, well yeah, before it was George Floyd, it was Eric Gardner. Oh, before it was Eric Gardner, it was Rodney King. Oh, before it was Rodney King, it was Emmett Till. And go through and kind of snatch his innocence away because as a as a father of a black boy of color, I want to prepare him for what is to come. And is it right that the world is like that? No. But when someone asks me, well, yeah, how, how are you holding up? I'm grieving. I'm grieving. I'm processing. And, and that's okay. But I but I do understand where you know, you do take advantage of moments where you can use it as an educational opportunity for allies. Um, but I, I, I'm not in the space where I want to take initiative and in lead in that conversation because I, I, I'm the victim. I just I think completely Kevin, agree with everything that was said. Oh, I'm sorry. I, sorry, Dan. No, you're fine. Go ahead, no, I, I, no, I no. said the same thing. I completely <laughs> agree. I think. I agree too. Yes, I um, following <laughs> George Floyd. And then having to be on a Zoom meeting when everyone looking at you. <laughs> and I just didn't have the energy. It was, um, I was really mourning, um, to, as Kevin mentioned, during that. But it wasn't just, that wasn't the first time I mourned. Like, it was not the first time I felt this way. I have a almost eight-year-old son. And I live in a pretty mixed community, um, a diverse community. And just having to explain to him why he can't have his Nerf guns outside to play while all the rest of his friends, I've been grieving and mourning this 
for a long time. Um, so I'm of the, I, I, I re received a lot of, from true friends, hey, how are you doing, that are from my, um, other communities to check in on me. And I was just like, I'm not doing well. How are you? <laughs> and, you know, I would have those conversations and things like that. But for a lot of others who I feel um, it wasn't a genuine check-in or something like that, it was just to check a box more from some of my leadership or to ask me to proof an email on what it, that they're gonna send out to show how they are woke and with you. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And I just, I, just, I, I didn't have it. Um, I, I think that I am with Kevin where I feel at this point, you can find any information online. You can read um, emails at, I mean, all information is at your fingertips in your phone. This is willful ignorance at this point. Mm -hmm. And so it is, I went to school for computer science. I did not go to school to teach this personally. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel that there has to be responsibility on the individual as we've been preached to a long time but to our communities that we have to pick ourselves up by the bootstraps mm -hmm. and we have that individual responsibility. This is that time for them. And yep. I, I'm with Kevin. I'm not signing up for anything anymore. I, I agree. <laughs> we had to have, of course, as leadership and different teams, they put together these focus groups for all of the people who are leading the, the Black initiatives for diversity and inclusion. And I was telling Darren, I'm exhausted. I don't want to have a conversation about what my black husband has to deal with on a regular basis or what I even have to experience. Like you said, educate yourself. There are plenty of Netflix documentaries. Mm -hmm. I had someone ask me, could I recommend some books and some videos to watch? <laughs> oh, Google. <laughs> Google. Yeah, hey, look, you're, you're a DNI, right. you're a DNI instructor oh, now. Yeah. <laughs> you, you are my boss. Like, if you could recommend something, Nicole, that you think would help me understand, really? And so I'm exhausted. I'm with you. I am a part of every diversity and inclusion initiative within my firm. Mm -hmm. I sit on um, any African woman, African American woman initiatives that we offer. But for this one by the third uh, team conversation, I, I couldn't do it anymore. I'm, I'm just, because my morning and my, what my family is dealing with is something that you will never understand until you educate from generations back how to correct your bias, you will never understand. And yeah. so I'm with you, Kevin, all day. I'm like, oh, I, I don't wanna teach this. I don't wanna, I don't wanna do it. And unfortunately, it is, it is a hard stance to take, you know? But, but, but at one point, do you, do you think, hey, you're at the table, you know, let's have a discussion. You know, uh, racism is so taboo to talk about. Race is taboo to talk about in the workplace. And right. so if you have a platform, you know, I agree. I, I'm, I'm tired of educating, but I don't mind educating. What I do hate is, is being a bridge to help someone feel better about mm -hmm. what happened and, you know, being oppressed. I mean, I, 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 that's not my job. You know, my, my thing is put in the effort, you know. Um, you know, ask questions. I'm okay with you asking me questions uh, of concern, of genuine concern and, and questions. You know, don't just ask me, well, what can I do? I mean, I had a lunch with a guy, um, an attorney, and he just started crying at the lunch. And I'm like, well, what the hell is he crying? You know, because I want to talk about race. And I was like, well, why are you crying? Why are you crying? You know, I'm thinking, I'm like, <laughs> I, I should be the one crying. And so, but it's just, it's, it's a lot of people don't get it, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't know if it's they don't, they're not trying to get it, or, or they just haven't. They've been so privileged, just haven't had to see it. And, and I explained to him, I'm like, listen, I said it's almost like you on, you on the worst team, and, and, and you always on the worst team, and, and you watch the other guy just win, and so, and you expect us to win with, with the, 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 not having the resources, and, and I was like, and I just gave, I, just, I tried to make it as palatable as possible because if I be real everybody can't handle it. And so for me, I feel like uh, we are in these subgroups. I'm going to talk about them and, I, and I'm going to be real. And some folks don't like it, you know, but it's, I feel like I'm at that table. I feel like I should have it because at this moment, people are asking a question, you know, they're asking a question that they didn't ask uh, a year ago, two years ago. I mean, they were running from it. And so now, I mean, it's, it's, it's the time to, to, to be real. If they ask it for it, give it to them. Agree, but I like to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations for people who are genuinely interested in wanting to know um, because you've had common ground and conversation prior to this. 
but ones that are just trying to check the box. I think my patience around um, being able to just help you check your box and, and say you've had the conversation is something I think you and I have talked about that can become exhausting, you know, having to really explain when there's plenty of information out there for them to understand. Yeah, I had a colleague, I had a colleague kind of do a check-in and uh, the end result was like, yeah, you know, I wanted to check in because, you know, I, I have racist family members and I just can't be around them. Okay, and what does that have to do with the cost of Kool-Aid in Kevin's house? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, okay, uh, uh, I'm sorry that you have some racist members of your family. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. It has nothing to do with me. And, and what we're going on. So I, I agree with Darren as far as if you have the platform and you have a seat at the table to drive those conversations, absolutely. But a lot of times in our industries, the DNI conversation, it's other duties as a sign or extra extra activities yeah. that yeah. are beyond your job description. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if you're gonna pay me to if you're gonna pay me to talk about DNI, then let's talk about DNI. But if I'm getting paid to bring a class into your institution, then uh, let me focus on my job and go home. I think that this is amazing. And I think that it's, it's really powerful. And I, I see a lot of chat going around about, you know, thank you for getting to this question because it's real, right? The energy that you all showed up with with this question was just so different <laughs> because it is real. It is exhausting. Um, and it's not just in 2020. And I think that that's what you all conveyed the most as to what I heard was, this is our life. And people want to be educated on something that has been a generational <laughs> educational lesson for us and how we show up in a space. And, you know, just, just to tie it all back together, because I am mindful of the time, um, we have... I want to bring back the idea of what our intent was when we started the session. We said that we wanted to make sure that we had an intent to inspire action. And I hear you all saying different types of actions, but if you could take 30 seconds or so to, to tell us how you've answered for the call of action, and or any advice that you would give. I've heard, go Google it, go look on Netflix. But if each of you could just kind of surmise that for us as we, before we open it up for any questions. So I'll, I'll jump in real quick. So I think, um, and I know it's 30 seconds, so I'll be quick. Um, similar to Kevin, I've worked in this space in terms of trying to bring forth other diverse women, um, men into IT for a long time, mentoring in other programs. Um, I think in the workplace, one of the things that I need to, if we're going to have a real conversation where things need to be driven, let's look at how our hiring practices, like where are you recruiting from? Where are you looking for candidates? Mm -hmm. um, if you're only looking in a certain bubble where, or even, only looking at majority uh, schools, majority white schools, but you want diversity, why? Why not go, <laughs> like, let's look at some of the things in your hiring practices if you're very serious about bringing diversity back into the workplace. Um, and I think that's one of those places with me, at least in management, I can help with and facilitate. I agree with Beth. Um, I participate in, like I said, even in and outside of work, um, different groups where I could mentor college students, um, help guide them in their path and bring them in for referral. Because I tell people all the time, you not only need a mentor in corporate America, you need a sponsor. And um, at work, um, my role is to help be that sponsor for those who are in a, a lower position than I am, that I can help them um, someone recognize their strengths and capabilities and someone shine a light on them and say, have you considered so-and-so, not just someone who's the obvious choice. Um, and so I feel like one of the things that I am actually working towards more for is we have now have more um, African-American interns. We are now looking at who's in an analyst role, like what is your progression goals 
and let me help you get there. Let me be an advocate for you because I think that there's not enough of us being advocated for behind the closed doors in the corporate settings. And so that is going to be definitely a contribution for me um, going forward to be able to help have more women at the table, more women in the executive roles and, and just be a part of it. And for me, uh, I, you know, I, I work in a business school. And so uh, I want to, uh, and I aspire to really impact by way of the kinds of students that we enroll in our MBA programs and uh, our analytics programs, uh, more people of color, more women. Um, and so from a professional standpoint, that's an angle. But I would say what, what's most important to me is to really reach out to my, my colleagues of color within my organization um, and, and across my organization. And um, some powerful uh, meetings have taken place where it's been all men of color within my institution. And we've met to vent and to check in on one another. And I think that's important because um, it's really through this, this concept of community that we can forge ahead and, and be productive because it give us, gives us the opportunity to vent. It gives us the opportunity to reflect, but it also gives us, the, gives, gives us the opportunity to collaborate and come up with a plan of action that's concrete that we can all hold each other accountable to. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's been uh, a, a very rewarding uh, experience that I've had. And, and then, uh, you know, trying to reach out and be a part of platforms um, like Shantae has provided us with tonight. She said, well, you know, can, can you talk about it? Absolutely, I'm gonna support you because uh, you're my girl, but also, I'm going to support you because it's necessary for a collective of, of, uh, of thinkers and thought leaders within our industry to come together to say, oh, oh, you in banking and I'm in higher ed and we go through the same thing. You got a smile on the elevator, even though it's 730 in the morning. <laughs> oh, I, I, I get it. I get it. And so I, I also yeah. think the more we have this kind of exposure, the, the more that we can find some common themes to really come, come up with concrete actions that are tangible. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm, I'm officially going before Kevin. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going out there anymore. Because <laughs> he, <laughs> he said everything I would say. So, uh, I mean, I, I agree. I think this is, this is a great start. I mean, honestly, is just having this conversation to, to let people know what we deal with. You know, um, I mean, I sit on boards like the Boys and Girls Club. I sit on boards for the inclusion and diversity for our company. And for, for me, it's, it's leveraging those two to, to push to more action, you know, and speaking up and having that, that platform to kind of leverage it. Because a lot of times you have companies that have these organizations or groups, and it's just to check a box and saying, hey, look, this is what we do. You know, we, we, we send a couple dollars here or not, you know, uh, it just sits here. But I think if we put it to use and, and make it work, and it's draw, drawing inclusion and it's drawing growth within the minority community within a company or making you feel inclusive, I think, I think that's a win. And so is being able to talk to the younger guys and saying, hey, what obstacles you know, you're going to face down the road? How do you avoid these roadblocks? How do you play the game? And so I think that is, that is kind of where I, I, I like to be um, and, and kind of that mentor role. And, and I enjoy it. So, Thank you all so much. So I know that we have a raised hand and a couple of questions. But before we get to that, I want to just um, kind of just close us out a little bit before I open this up for questions. Um, so it's 7.23, so I'm mindful of the time. <laughs> and I know that people are, you know, having to jump on other calls because we're in a Zoom, Zoom space. <laughs> um, so I want to be mindful of that. Um, but I also just want to reiterate, because I said I was going to do it, <laughs> that everything that you heard here tonight are personal experiences of the panelists and head nods and shakes of myself as the individuals that we are and not a representation of any of the organizations to which we are affiliated with. We all, this panel, the panel and I are affiliated with a lot of organizations, including our, our, our nine to five. And so I want to make sure that I just reiterate that I appreciate you all for your stories that you have shared and your experiences and your perspective. And hell, just saying yes. <laughs> just saying yes and helping me. I know each of you differently um, and in different spaces. And so I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And with that, I see a raised hand. So I believe that means, Ali, you want to come on the camera and talk to the panelists. 
And so I'm going to let one of the co-hosts do what they do. I think you have to unmute yourself and um, start your video. Oh, there you are. Hello. 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 Can I ask my question? Yeah, so um, it looks like I'm frozen a bit. Oh, no, there I go. So my name is Ali Tinsley. Uh, I'm a lead software developer with Maximus. I've been in the IT space for like 20 years. And uh, so I wanted to expand on what you guys feel about how your mask affect your personal lives. Because I know sometimes when you can't turn off that mask, when you go back home and deal with your family, maybe you're not your immediate family or your extended family, how does that mask affect some of your relationships when you can't turn that off? I can jump in. I'll start. I keep starting. Sorry. Um, thank you for the question. I think for me personally, I feel drained after the day. Like a lot of times when I'm on my way home, I almost need the traffic to come down and switch back into myself. I'm like assuming back into my, um, my, my genuine self sometimes and slipping off that mask. Um, by Thursday in a week, I'm done. My family knows like Thursday night, let's just give her space like, <laughs> for a little bit so I can just come down off of everything um, with the meetings. I think there's a level of stress that gets baked in on top of our demands of our job because there is a need to kind of every now and again be on guard for someone trying to test or to try to undermine or have a passive aggressive tone and stuff. Um, I think it's draining. That's the best way I can describe it. And it is difficult. My family sees it too, and they've kind of work around it. Like, okay, mom comes home, give her about 30 minutes to herself, and then she's re-engaged. And that's, and that's where it is. <laughs> I, know, I know for me, that was something that I had to learn throughout my career. Because at one point in my career, I thought what I did was who I was. Mm. Right? And so if what I did was, you know, I'm... I'm speaking to large audiences throughout the course of the day. I'm in 20 meetings. I have to make decisions. Like you can't run your household like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so um, for, from my perspective, it's, it, it was, it's a learning curve, honestly. And, you know, and I made a commitment to myself that, you know, I'm not going to bring the stressors of, of the workplace into my home. Cause in my, it's in my home where I have to find peace and well, and now where I have peace. And uh, no, nobody's going to compromise that for me. And I, I'll take it a step further. I mean, I've found myself having to even, I mean, in, in banking, we have a lot of galas and you have a lot of uh, banquets and events and co uh, corporate dinners. And so I found myself, you know, asking my wife, you know, she got a mask too. We're, we're, we're coming to this thing as a unified front. And so I need her to play the game, have that smile on. She got to look the part. And so it's unfair to her, but it, it, it is kind of the unspoken expectation. She does a great job of playing it, but, you know, she's like, I thought you just all played and entertained all the time. And then I take her out on this uh, to a dinner and she's like, I'm tired as hell. I was like, <laughs> you know, so yeah, I was like, welcome to my world. Yeah. And, uh, but I think she, she gets it now. So I get a little more leniency now when I come home and just drain because, so when she asked me to do something, I'm like, I just need 10 minutes, give me 10 minutes. Uh, and, and she respects it. So I think that is, is communication for sure. But I, I have trouble kind of, turning it off sometimes so if uh, being one, of things, <laughs> one of the things that I, I say sometimes when I get home because kind of like you said Darren we do a lot of entertaining we do a lot of smooching with clients not only in my profession but my husband's profession as well we we've talked about it we've got to put it on for both both jobs mm -hmm. And sometimes I come home from work or after being, even now, being on Zoom meetings all day, and I'm like, I've used all my words for today. I just don't want to talk anymore. Um, and, and, and it's so unfair to not only your friends and family who want to catch up with you in the evenings because they just want to check in, or your children who want to talk about their day. And so trying to figure out how to find that extra energy to be able to do that. Like you said, it's exhausting. Um, it's exhausting, but we do what we got to do and we, and we figure it out. So I'm, I'm like, Beth, I always say I, I need, I need a, a horizontal rest. I mean, I'm just going to lay here, no TV, no nothing before I cook dinner. And I'm going to clear my mind and, and, and to get myself ready for my next job is what, yeah. what pretty much how I feel about it. So. 
thank you, Ali, for that question. And I know that there's a lot of activity in the chat, but we are right at 729 and I'm a woman of my word. <laughs> and so I just want to say um, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and do you all have any closing remarks? And if, and I, as I said before, um, I know that you all said that you were willing to stay on for the additional 30 minutes if people had additional questions or comments and topics that they wanted to talk about. Um, and so we're, we will transition right into that space because it's 730. I just can't thank you all enough. I can't thank the people who have attended enough for really joining us. Um, this was, I know I text Kevin at really late one night and Nicole really early one morning. <laughs> <laughs> And then Beth early too, you know, so I was just like, ah, um, and I mistakenly called Darren. And so but I just, I say that it <laughs> came together kind of, you know, in my mind and putting the pieces together because I too am going through some, you know, of my own issues with how do I show up? Um, and you all talked about diversity and inclusion, and we have a lot of my diversity and inclusion partners and family on here. Um, so if you need some help, let me know. We got some practitioners um, available and ready. Um, but no, just wanted to say um, again, thank you all. And we will open it up for questions and additional conversation. I see the chat just lighting up. So thank you guys for the love. Thank you. Thank you. I just have to say thank you. This is Jackie Roberts. I don't have my picture up, but um, it was very nice to come in here that I'm not the only professional out here hearing the same things. And, and hearing also your perspectives of what you are putting into place moving forward. I think that's the biggest piece amongst ourselves is to be able to have the conversation and let people understand, yeah, you're starting to feel the ripped off bandaid in my life that doesn't change every day. Um, because of what happened to George Floyd. But the conversation shouldn't stop. So thank you so much for putting this on. I so appreciate it. Thank and all you. the panelists, thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Thank you, thank you. Um, so there was one question in the chat. Well, there, there are a lot, but now I don't know that I'm gonna be able to find it. I might help. Anyone else have any questions that they would like to ask the panelists or topics or conversation? So can I hear uh, yeah. you? Sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I'm, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I'm in my car, that's why I don't have my video on. So uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't remember the young lady's name, but the uh, young lady that attended the HBCU. Uh, do, so you said something that was very impactful as I'm driving, because I attended FAMU University myself. Um, do you think, I'm, I'm assuming you probably took that business class, because you talked about putting that mask on. Yeah. Do you think yeah. it, was, it was detrimental to your career growth or helpful to your career growth? Because as soon as you said that, I said, wow, I got to, you know, I'm, I was the first to graduate from a family um, from college. So it, that, that upbringing of playing the game wasn't there. But what it made me realize when you spoke was I got to walk and talk how I wanted to for about 19 to 20 years. And then when I got ready to graduate, hey, you got to do this. You got to do that. Right. Or I seen my peers, hey, neatly, neat dreads in the head. Hey, man, you might have to cut that off to get a job. Or like the guy's comment, he has a beard. Hey, man, you got to shave that down. So it's just kind of like, it seems like that mask is actually put on way before you get to corporate America. And it sounded like you said, uh, you know, you said in your mid thirties before you felt comfortable, yeah. right? So you're talking yeah. 12 plus years or, or more before you got to be yourself. And so do you think that, you know, that HBCU teaching of, hey, dress this way, talk this way, look this way hurts or helps you in the long no. end? No, I absolutely. I absolutely think it helped me um, because it got me the interview, it got me to in the door. It got me the opportunity to prove what I could do. Um, I think that just um, the, the refinement that went on in college and what they drilled into us in terms of how to interview, how to present yourself, how to communicate effectively, um, all of that um, helped me to be, 
to prove myself in the office to a point where I became a subject matter expert. I became, my brand was built and I became more confident. It empowered me actually um, to be more confident. I also think by going to an HBCU where a lot of my professors in computer science were African-American, it built something in me that I knew that I could do it too. Sometimes in these fields, I know I've had a lot of friends who started off in engineering and within the first five years of engineering in their career, a lot of folks switch out because of it's different once you're in corporate America and you feel isolated, they end, to, they end up leaving their careers. Um, there's a huge um, rate of people swapping careers, with, uh, changing careers out of engineering after in the first five years. Um, I will say that my HBCU, by providing those examples um, with the professors, by um, the business classes that we took, um, I felt much more confident walking into a interview to sell myself and to explain to people why I deserve this position over others. It, 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 it empowered me. I, I don't take it to a detriment at all. I, I thought it was uh, uh, just what I needed. And similar to you, my parents were both professionals, but not in IT. My dad, um, he was an accountant. My mom, she's a chemist, um, different industries growing up. So um, even though there was a certain level of, hey, this is what you do. My dad was very traditional in the suits and everything up until he retired. He wore a suit every day, every day, black, white shirt, tie for 40 years on the job. Um, but yes, I, I don't think it was a detriment at all to answer your question. Thank you, Michael, for that question and Beth for the answer. Um, I believe, Brandon, you have your hand up and you can either and or come off of mute and take your camera off or you could just come off of mute, ask your question. Uh, great, hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Great, uh, thank you so much for, for having us all and, and having this conversation. Um, this is more of just kind of a comment that I, I wanted to share, but um, as listening to all of all of your uh, experiences with this, I think I some of it resonated with me as um, having experiences being both out as a gay person at work and um, not, and kind of that idea of having on a mask or or being an out and and having to put on kind of different roles um, and and always kind of thinking about those implications. Um, that was something that just definitely resonated, and um, I appreciate the the hearing your experiences on that. I'm not sure if you can see everyone with their heads or nodding. So thank you for your comment, Brandon. Um, I believe I saw another hand. Adrian? Yeah, hey girl, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, good. So um, uh, Shante, thank you so much. And to all of our fa fabulous panelists here, I just want to say thank you. Um, when Shante put this up on Facebook, you know, I, I wrote out and I was like, I want to be sensitive. If this is a time and space where a person of my color is not needed at the table, please let me know. And she was very much just please come. And I just thank you so much because these are perspectives and conversations that are very challenging, I think, to have in the work environment because it's work, right? And because there is that layer of professionalism. And I think also as a manager, I don't want to offend any of my colleagues. I don't want to put the, the folks that are reporting to me in weird situations. So I just want to say thank you all so much for your candor tonight and, and being very transparent. Um, so I work in alumni engagement in higher ed. So Kevin, thank you so much for all that you're doing. Um, it's a it's a difficult industry to work in. And um, I think I, I've had a colleague that has said, you know, as you look further up the chain, the, the number of minorities who are holding leadership roles are fewer and fewer. And that is a lens that I have really conscientiously tried to, to think through. And, and uh, so I appreciate your perspectives there. Um, working with graduates, and I'm currently at an uh, what used to be an all women's college, um, you know, the, we are, a lot of our alumni population come from affluent white families. And so this whole level of diversity is a brand new topic and, and it's sort of um, challenging to, to be here and, and to try to facilitate that, especially knowing that the perspectives that folks are coming to the table are, are so, so different. So what I just wanna say is um, that you all are right, that the job is not yours, um, it, it is ours. It's the, it's the people 
who wear my skin tone. It's, it's our job to extend the arm. It's not your job to come to us and say, here's our list of demands. And so I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm saying that and that I've heard that and I really appreciate that perspective to each of you is that it's my job to reach out and to across the aisle and where there wasn't a seat at the table to offer a seat at the table where there wasn't dialogue happening on my part to do that. So um, it's not so much a question, but just more of a, I appreciate this perspective. It's so, so crucial. And I think as we look in higher ed and the diversity of our students that are coming to the table as first generation, it's incredibly crucial to make sure that they feel supported and that they know that they're not going into the workforce by themselves, that, that there is this community and that happens on both sides of the aisle. So just uh, my gratitude and appreciation for this conversation tonight. Thank you all. Thank you, Adrian. I would, I would, uh, I appreciate your comments. Uh, what, what school, by the way, if you don't mind me sharing, if you don't mind sharing. Absolutely. So I'm at Mary Baldwin University in Stanton. In Stanton, Virginia. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know all of the, uh, the all women or formerly all women schools in Virginia. So Absolutely. I, I would say that, especially as, as it relates to dealing with first generation college students, um, you know, it's a new territory, new, new territory. You don't know what you don't know. Right. And when you don't see people in an environment that look like you or come from the or share have shared experiences that also impacts your retention. Because it's like, you know, happy students graduate. That's the, that's the bottom line. One plus one equals two. A lot of institutions make this weird, complicated formula. Well, how do we get more people of color? How do we get more people, more people of first generation background? Well, you, you create an environment where they're comfortable and they have advocates and mentors and sponsors <laughs> that come in the form of administrators and faculty members and uh, senior, level, senior level executives. And so um, I, I, it's, a, it's a problem that's plaguing higher ed, but I think COVID has uh, shifted higher ed's train of thought for the better, I, I would hope. Um, but I, I, I would agree. But you know, when, when you're relating to first generation college students, man, you have to create an environment of inclusivity, but uh, an environment where they feel comfortable to be vulnerable to learn because that's where that's when the mo most of your learning takes place on the college campus. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. And I would just say, Adrian, um, I, I felt that this discussion was very important to not just have people who are black involved in hearing it. Kevin mentioned earlier that at his current place of employment that the black men have gotten together and they vented and they've talked about it. And one of the things that I've seen is that we talk about it a lot, but the people who need to hear what we're talking about aren't present. And so I wanted to ensure that this platform was not just a space for us to have a conversation, but for those that need to hear it, to really hear it. So um, I, I'm not sure, I can't remember who, who joined us, if you, maybe Jackie Roberts um, told us that it was good to hear that it wasn't just her. And I saw in the, in the chat where people have said, you know, thank you for allowing us to be in this space. And so I, it's really, it was really important to me not to have a closed event. Um, not to say that there may not be one, but to say that this space that I wanted to, to create for us was one that was for us and our allies. Because, uh, and for those that know me know that I've gone to two or three predominantly white institutions. And so my experience is slightly different. Um, and I've been in corporate America since I graduated. And so my experience and how, um, and how I show up is different. And so I didn't want to alienate anyone from my community that I felt like genuinely um, are allies and not just people just trying to be in my business. So um, do we have any other questions or hands raised? It is 744. Um, Oh my gosh, and we still have 28 people on with us, y'all. This is amazing. Um, is there anything that you all want to say or talk about before we close out? Because I don't want to hold you if no one has anything else. Um, I was just going to reiterate something, and I'll stop talking. I promise y'all I will. <laughs> like, yeah. um, 
I think we talked a little bit about um, when we were talking about actions that we can do now. Um, we talked about, well, I mentioned about the hiring practices and making sure people were brought in for the diverse. But um, as I mentioned, in the first five years of a lot of people who join out of college into IT industry, they end up leaving. There's a huge rate of uh, folks switching out of the industry because they find it either too hard, too challenging, isolating, or things like that. That's typically what um, um, surveys have said. Um, I think building the network or framework within the business um, once you've spent the effort to recruit people to make sure they're there and they have the support throughout their career um, and then give them opportunities to support others who are coming in is key to really bringing diversity along its way. It's, um, it's one thing to come like, you know, I spent a lot of my early career in consulting. So people move from businesses every two years or so or something like that. But um, one of those things that I, I, I felt um, when I moved from job to job is, is it just me? Are there anyone in the leadership position that looks like me? Do I see a way forward? Um, I spent all this time getting here and then I felt like I was on an island. Um, so that was just one of those things I wanted to reiterate that I think we need to just across the board sometimes in different industries do a better job of. We spend this time on saying we need to hire, but then what are we doing to maintain them? and help giving them the framework they need. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll add to that. I mean, uh, I know I, I kept mentioning playing the game and, and Beth, you said something. I mean, in my, my thing is, is knowing your worth. You know, I think uh, have that career path, uh, know that career path and, and don't let a company or, or institution dictate that. If a company is not supporting it, then it's time to make a move. And I think to, to be honest with you, you know, I've learned that later in my career, you know, companies will pay more to get you and at least to keep you. And so understand that piece of it and know your value, you know. So uh, don't feel just happy to have a job, you know, and sell in it because we, we, we are pretty awesome. I'm telling you, we're, we're resilient. Um, I think uh, just just keep that in mind because you'll see times where you'll be asked to, to take on an assignment, like Kevin said, take on extra assignment and not receive the pay. What that doing, what that's doing is putting more pressure on you to, for your uh, limits on you accomplishing your real job, you know? And so, and they don't touch on that in your review. And so they don't touch on all the extra things that you're doing. So be careful of that, um, you know, but stay focused, have your career path written out and, and stay true to it, you know, so. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I am getting a message that Ali has a question, something Beth said. My kindred IT spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so two things. First of all, so yes, we do drop a lot of software fairly quickly. Like, um, I've had some positions I wanted to fill, and I specifically were looking for minorities to fill those. And I spent, I was on Facebook, Instagram, asking everyone, "Hey, you know, software developers, I have some yeah. good paying, long term remote jobs. It's like the perfect." And I could not find anyone because all of the people that look like me that are able to have those abilities already have a job and there's really not a lot of young people that too like hey pull into this job but on the flip side of that i have found myself sometimes i work so hard to get where i am sometimes i just feel like i'm too tired to try and assist anyone to bring their skill level up as well so i see both sides of that uh, i'll just say comment. One comment i i i hear what you're saying i see one more comment so I feel like, um, I know, I, I, I tell this story to some of the girls that I've mentored in the past. When I first left college, um, I went to work for an IT company. When I graduated college, I had almost a 4.0 in computer science. Um, I was president of the Honor Society for Computer Science, all, this, all these accolades and all these awards. So when I went to work for this company, this big Fortune 500 company, I was super excited. There was another gentleman who had graduated from a Midwestern school he and I uh, were the same age, we started at the same time, and we were on the same, our peer teams in the same department. Um, he and I were having lunch one time, and he told me at the time that, um, what, how they recruited him, how he barely graduated, and he was making $15,000 more than me, and we're the same age. <laughs> and in that moment, I began to realize, um, Right there, it was like a shock to my system that I need to 
uh, always know what I'm worth. Always know what I, um, I should be paid, how I should be recognized. It actually emboldened me and motivated me um, tremendously and lit a fire under me to prove myself even more to a point where I started um, taking on some of the worst assignments and trying to fix it and like uh, things along those lines. Um, I think that sometimes when we're um, in these situations where we feel either isolated or devalued and stuff, it's a chance for us to be empowered. It's a chance for us to become motivated. And it's an opportunity for us to take a situation that may be sour, to learn what we can and then move on to what Darren was mentioning, to somewhere else that will value me. I'm gonna take everything I could out of this one position. I'm gonna get what I need, get out certifications, whatever I need, and then move on to somewhere that valued me more. Um, and it was a life lesson that I continue. And I think the important lesson that I, I found in that first position, that I, the reason why even when I have nothing left and I don't really feel like it, I still mentor, is because I don't want anyone else to be in a position of feeling that way. And if I'm now in this position of management, I'm gonna do everything I can to pull that pipeline above, up as well. So um, that was all I wanted to share. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. No worries. <laughs> Oh my God, this conversation has been so, I don't know, I've been planning this for weeks, so I'm just so excited <laughs> that it's actually come to fruition and that um, that the four of you, just your energy is just like I thought it would, which just give me everything that I've been, I was looking for for this. I just can't thank you guys enough for Tuesday evening, <laughs> spending it with us. Um, any parting words? It's 7.51 and I don't see any additional questions or hands in the air. So do you all have any parting words? Dante, I'll, 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 I'll say uh, thank you for setting this up. I think, uh, I know you had a vision with this and, and hope it met that, but uh, this was awesome. I think you were informative in preparing us for this. So I just want to tell you, thank you for that. Thank I you. wanna I wanna add to that, sure. Dante. Um, from day one that I've met you, you and I connected immediately um, across the room. Your professionalism and your willingness to, to be able to be heard, it just speaks volumes. And so I want to thank you as well. Um, your PMP skills, girl, on point as always. <laughs> Keeping us in line. <laughs> I have experienced it firsthand at work uh, previously and you still do such an amazing job. So thank you um, for the organization, the professionalism of putting this together, um, especially during the current environments that we are in where Zoom has become our way of communication. So thank you for including me. Thank you. My second and third and fourth, everything that they said. Um, Shante, I think you are the epitome of truly mastering your craft. And I think that's what we need to do in order to thrive while being black in the workplace. Mm, and I'm not even a crier. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you all so much, so much. Um, and I did record it, although I missed my opening spiel, but that's okay. <laughs> I did record it. And so I'll share it. Um, with those that register for the event, but um, particularly to the panelists so that you guys can um, do what you would like with it. Um, again, I say it, I've said it, I think three times at this point, but everything that we've expressed is us as, as people and as humans and, and not of any of the organizations that we're affiliated with. And I keep saying that because I too have bills and want to keep my job. <laughs> <laughs> we all have different spaces and so while this is a platform that I have this is also um you know my part-time job until further notice so thank you all so much your You're interview welcome. was amazing I love 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 you all and to all those that joined us thank you so much thank you for your comments in the chats and um, coming off of mute and and just really participating and hanging in there with us and I'll be damned if I'm not going to give you back six minutes of your day. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. You guys were amazing. All right. thank appreciate you. it. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you guys. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys. Bye -bye. All right.
Jay, you still there? Yep, I'm here. Cool, cool. I see we have a couple of people that are still on with us. Uh -huh. um, so we can we can drop out and I can give you a quick call. Okay, that sounds good. I don't, I don't, well, should, actually, hold I on, hold on. So now you have to go. It looks like 